So in terms of the screen right here, keep in mind when we're looking at the thalamus, hypothalamus, that material that we discuss at the end, that material will be on the final exam. So write the notes on it, but I want you guys to focus mainly right now on the lecture exam three, which is on 11, 12, and part of 13. So let's take a look right here. We talked about the brainstem previously. The brainstem is a combination of your medulla obligata, your pons, and our midbrain area that includes the superior and inferior, inferior colliculus combined, they form the corpora quadrigema. So those regions that we see at the very start of our brain, in terms of overall function, it's very important because especially the medulla, that's your cardiovascular center basically. It controls your heart rate, your force of contraction, your blood pressure, and your respiratory rate, all allowing us to live. Without those areas of the brainstem, the medulla right there, you will die almost immediately. By the way, I know we mentioned it previously in our classes, is when people die from massive whiplash, like Dale Earnhardt died from massive whiplash, what happened with him was the medulla basically got obliterated because the dense process found in your axis, right, your second cervical vertebrae, that dense process immediately went up into the foramen magnum and destroyed the medulla obliganta. So almost immediately, the blood pressure went to zero and he'd have no blood flow in the brain. He would pass out and never wake up. So in some ways, you know, that's a quick, I wouldn't know if it's painless, but it's a quick death. So it wouldn't be the worst way to die, but for me, I would probably want to be old and on lots of meds, right, with my family around me, and then we'll go, right? That's probably the best way to die, but that wouldn't be the most terrible. So pons, midbrain, all of that will be on the lecture exam material for this one, lecture exam three. So if I ask something like, yes, which of these reflexes allows you to turn your head to visualize spontaneous or sudden movements? Immediately, superior colliculi. Or you hear it a loud bang, and immediately you turn your head towards that sound. Which of these nuclei will allow us to focus our attention and turn our head so we can visualize where that sound comes from? Inferior colliculi. So when we talk about the inferior and superior colliculi, that's where we will see the clusters of cell bodies that will then allow you to turn your head to that site, right? Now the cerebellum, and I think we stopped a little bit further ahead, the cerebellum right here, and then the thalamus, and I think we stopped after the hypothalamus. Actually, I think we got pretty far, right? We went into the cerebrum too. When you look at the cerebrum, keep in mind that the gyrus is just the brain matter that has been folded. The greater the intensity of folds, the tighter the folds, the greater the number of neurons. Again, we have seen, I don't know if you guys have seen videos or pictures of what they say is uh, Albert Einstein's brain. Well, in the brain itself of Albert Einstein, brilliant person, right? Genius level, high genius level. And what happened was that even at death, he didn't have dementia. And when we look at his brain at death, it was still nice and tightly folded. Now, if you have somebody with Alzheimer's, the folds will start to loosen. As a fold starts to loosen, it's an indirect sign that you have a lot of cell death. And the neurons, throughout the brain area will start to die off and are dead. Uh, the cerebral medulla, again, this is a material for the final exam. Understand the cerebral medulla is not the same as the medulla apoganta. Cerebral medulla is the medulla in terms of fibers, allowing us to connect different regions of the brain to different 
regions of the same hemisphere, the projection, the association fibers, or it allows us to cross over from one hemisphere to another. And we have commissarial fibers that will help form the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum then are the fibers that are formed by the commissarial fibers that cross over from one side of the hemisphere to the other side. They allow for communication between the hemispheres. Again, if you ever want to watch something really interesting, watch videos about people that have had their corpus callosum cut. And you're probably wondering, why in the world would you do something that drastic, right? Why would a doctor cut the corpus callosum? So then there'll be no communication between the two hemispheres. The reason is you're desperate. Usually people that has to have that corpus callosum resected are people that have such violent seizures that medication can't even help. So if you've had seen somebody with a grand mal seizure where the whole body is just shaking, you can't live like that, especially if it happens almost continuously. So if you have a family member, know somebody that's in that situation, yeah, there might be a time where they say, you know what, we have to, you know, cut that corpus callosum and that will stop usually the seizures from occurring as frequently. The problem then is just no communication and you can't have phantom limb syndrome, you can't have alien limb syndrome. That does happen and it's pretty scary when it does. Now, let's take a look at the basal nuclei and keep in mind the basal nuclei is sometimes known as a basal ganglia. So they kind of, uh, when we look at this, remember the difference between a nucleus the difference between a nucleus and a ganglia is location. So when we're looking at the basal nucleus, in the old days, we would sometimes call it the basal ganglia, right? We didn't really make that distinction as much back then. So you will see online that it's also called basal ganglia. It's the same thing. So the basal nuclei, basal ganglia, are a series of connections between areas that are deep into the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe region. Connections that are part of the caudate nucleus, the internal capsule, that allows for adjustments in neuron activity, specifically motor neurons, so then you can plan and then coordinate the motor neurons for movements. Now, in terms of movements, all voluntary movements start with cell bodies found in the pre-central gyrus. So I want you to think of somebody that is a puppeteer. Have you guys ever seen those puppets where somebody, they're connected to strings and the puppeteer is using their fingers to move the puppet. Now, in my culture in Indonesia, we actually had some kind of, you know, it, it was like a well-known thing that there would be puppet shows like this. And obviously don't call it puppet shows, right? It's a little bit more classic than that. And the person would just kind of move the puppet in such a way that it looks like the puppet was moving by itself. And you don't even see the person moving it. And it was a show and the puppets just kind of move around and they act like they're walking around and talking. And what happens is that's what's happening with the upper motor neurons found in the post-central, in the pre-central gyrus. They are going to have wires that comes down and communicates with the lower motor neurons, which then causes your motor, you know, your somatic skeletal muscles to move. But all of that, those wires right there, starting at the precentral gyrus, all they do is that they're just connected to your body. You need a way to figure out how do I cause that movement? When do I contract my muscles? So then I have nice, smooth movement. So then when I'm running, I don't push off too hard, right? So then I don't step down too early or I don't contract the extensor muscles at the same time as I contract the flexor muscles. So you need all that coordination for how hard, when, 
to stimulate, when to inhibit. All of that is going to be found in the basal nuclei. The precentral gyrus is just the actual wires that we have to activate, right? The rest of the movement cycles right here are giving you a game plan, right? How do we move those wires? So then you have a nice, natural, smooth movement. Because keep in mind, what sets us apart is a couple things. One, high order, high function, conscious thought. The second thing is this. We're the only animals that only walk on two legs. Because of that, we need more areas of the brain that allows us to then have more balance and equilibrium. Right? Now, I think we end it with a dura mater, Falk's rebri, uh, rebri tentorum cerebelli, Falk's cerebelli, and I'll show you videos of that, right? And I do have videos online too. Uh, with the Falk's rebri, you can see it on this picture right here. The Falk's rebri is important because the Falk's rebri allows us to separate the hemispheres. Now, this sounds stupid, but what would happen if you cut the brain in half and you have nothing in the middle to stabilize it? Every time you turn your head, wouldn't the sides of the hemispheres hit each other? They would, right? So we need something in that compartment known as a longitudinal fissure. That separation between the hemispheres, that's a longitudinal fissure. We need something physical to keep the two hemispheres apart so they don't slap each other. That's one of the functions of the Fox rebri. It compartmentalizes each side. Perfect. Now besides having the dura mater that moves in, separating and protecting the hemispheres from colliding against each other, we also see veins, very large low pressure veins called the dural sinuses, right? The dural venal sinus, there's one at the very top. We call it the superior sagittal sinus, right at the top. Then you have one at the very bottom of a Farc's bride, and that's called the inferior sagittal sinus. The superior, we're gonna see, right? Superior is gonna be very important. And it's very important because of what it does in terms of not just blood movement, but cerebrospinal fluid movement. So let's talk about the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid, and I'll kind of skip to this one, similar to serum, but very little proteins. It bathes the brain and the spinal cord, protecting and allowing the brain itself to float over the top surface, the basin of our skull. Remember, if you've seen like a real skull, right? The anterior, the middle, and the posterior basin areas, those are all very sharp. So we need the brain to be floating over it, not landing directly on top of it. It cushions, so then the brain is protected from the, its own protective structures. So what else do we see in terms of CSF? It's produced. And this is one of the questions I would ask in a multiple choice question is, which cells help you produce cerebrospinal fluid? And the cells that do are those ependymal cells that line the choroid plexus. Whenever you hear the word plexus, plexus are network, right? A network of arteries and veins, we call it the choroid plexus. The brachial plexus are a network of nerves that helps form your name nerves. So plexus are just network. So the choroid plexus are a network of blood vessels that we see in the brain, and they're lined with ependymal cells. Those ependymal cells are found with the blood vessels, and their main purpose is to filter blood, producing cerebrospinal fluid at a rate of half a liter a day. So you produce half a liter a day of CSF, it makes sense. Every day, you need to reabsorb the same amount. If you don't, then you have too much formation and you will have too much of a buildup of cerebrospinal fluid that will cause you to have hydrocephalus. 
Now, keep in mind, everybody should have a steady amount of cerebrospinal fluid. So hydrocephalus, the name itself makes it seem like you have water in the brain. Yeah, hydrocephalus is too much water in the brain. We all should have water in the brain. It's just when we have too much of it, then we have condition called hydrocephalus. So we have these areas of our brain that are pretty empty. The empty areas of the brain, let me see if we can see it right here. I know there's a picture of it previously. Right here. So if you take a look deep inside, right here, see how deep inside it looks pretty empty? So we split the hemispheres in half. You can see the empty spaces deep inside the brain. Well, those empty spaces deep inside the brain are not really empty. The reason why is because those empty spaces would be filled, and it's in a person that's alive, the empty spaces would be filled with cerebrospinal fluid. The empty spaces of the brain corresponds to this, ventricles. So we have two really big ventricles in each hemisphere. We call it the lateral ventricles. Now, the lateral ventricles are really deep in the actual brain matter. So if you produce cerebral spinal fluid there, that fluid is trapped really deep in the brain. Doesn't help the brain then, does it? Remember, we want that CSF to cover the brain and allowing it to float. So if we form it deep and it stays deep, really we have a major issue. So we need a pathway to make the cerebrospinal fluid and allow it to drain out. So that's what the ventricular system allows us to do. So the very first thing I want you to understand is we have two lateral ventricles. Each of the lateral ventricles will produce a lot of cerebrospinal fluid a day. Now, I don't need you to know the parts of the ventricles, the anterior, posterior horn, posterior lateral, posterior inferior horn. All right? I just want you to know the lateral ventricle. Right? The lateral ventricles are on each side, and it's found deep in the cerebrum. And you can see how it's kind of figured right here. It looks like the C in the Chicago Bears. Right? And what happens is that that C means that it's not just one lobe region that has the lateral ventricles. It crosses from the frontal to the temporal to the occipital, and even it goes into the, right, temporal lobe as well. So there's a lot of space inside the cerebrum where we see the lateral ventricles. So each side, the lateral ventricles produces cerebral spinal fluid, which then drains into the third ventricle. The third ventricle is found right in the middle. So the third ventricle, and I'm going to show it to you right on this picture where we see that cut. Let me see, I think it's way in the very beginning, sorry. So the third ventricle, actually it could be over here, is that area that is found with the hypothalamus. So if you take a look at this slide right here, you see the hypothalamus nucleus, and you can see that it looks kind of glossy, superior to it. Looks like an empty space. The reason why? It's because it is an empty space. That's the area of the third ventricle. That third ventricle looks glossy because it should be filled with water. It should be filled with cerebrospinal fluid. The third ventricle then receives the CSF produced by the lateral ventricles. As it receives it, it receives it by way of a opening. That opening right, is called the interventricular foramen. And you can see it, there's an arrow leader line right into the green kind of connection between the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. So that third ventricle region is a region that we also see the hypothalamus underneath. So the inferior part of the third ventricle, that's where we find the hypothalamus. In other words, you're draining it from the lateral ventricles on each side. Now we're moving it to the middle of the brain. The middle of the brain region is the area of the third ventricle. Inferior part of the third ventricle is where we see the hypothalamus. Now, 
it's still deep in the brain. We still need to another pathway to bring that fluid out. So we then have all that fluid produced by the lateral ventricles draining into the third by way of the interventricular foramen. The third ventricle adds even a little bit more cerebrospinal fluid. So now we have a lot of CSF and it's all stuck deep in the brain. So how do we get it out? We get it out by way of a pathway that starts with the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct is actually an empty line that we see between the pons and the medulla and the cerebellum. So in reality, yeah, we see the cerebral aqueduct right here coming down and it looks solid. In reality, it's an open space. So it's kind of inverted. Anything that's solid that we see on this slide is basically hollow in real life, filled with water. So the cerebral aqueduct receives all that fluid from the ventricles above and now brings it to the last ventricle, the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is an empty space from between the brainstem and the cerebellum. In this fourth ventricle area, that's where we see openings called the lateral and the medial apertures. Those openings allow then that fluid to come out and then surround the brain itself. So let me see if there's a right here, right? So you produce it in the lateral ventricles. I thought there was a better picture. There isn't, right? So you produce a fluid at first by way of the lateral ventricles deep in the hemispheres. Then you drain it by an opening called the, la the interventricular foramen. As you drain that fluid, it goes to the next space, the third ventricle. In the area of the third ventricle, that's also the area of the hypothalamus. So the third ventricle produces its own amount of CSF that's added to everything already passed down from the lateral ventricles. Then all that, now a lot of cerebrospinal fluid passes to the cerebral aqueduct. Even at this point, all that fluid is trapped deep inside the brain matter. As it hits, all that CSF hits the fourth ventricle, that's where we see the openings. Openings in the fourth ventricle called apertures allows the CSF to drain out of the brain and then it surrounds the external compartments of the brain, allowing the brain to flow. Perfect. Now, I'm trying to show you, hopefully there's that. And the way, the best way to see the fourth ventricle and how it looks is way at the very beginning. So I apologize, I have to do this, go all the way to the very beginning to show you a cut of the brain. So right here. Now, if you look at that space, your cerebellum's over here, right? Here's your cerebellum. Over here, because I can't use a pointer, there's no pointer here, right? This area right here, and I'll, right? That's your medulla down here and the pons. Do you see that open space between the cerebellum and the pons and the medulla? That is the area of the fourth ventricle. The area above it, that line, that's your cerebral aqueduct. Now, I do have a video online that shows it on a model. So keep in mind, I do have all this on videos already. It's already linked. So I want you to know that that pathway, again, is empty space. You look at that empty space between the cerebellum, right here, to the right of our screen, and the pons to the left. That empty space, that's a fourth ventricle space. That's where we find the apertures, which allows us then to bring that fluid out of the internal structure of the brain. As it exits out of the brain, then we can have it surround the outside of the brain, allowing it to bathe the brain in very protective, very glucose-rich cerebrospinal fluid. Now, what happens and how do we get the cerebrospinal fluid out? So cerebrospinal fluid, remember, we have to reabsorb it. The cerebrospinal fluid is found deep to the arachnoid mater. 
So in the subarachnoid space, we have this big amount of cerebrospinal fluid, half a liter being produced a day. So in that subarachnoid space, we have little things called the arachnoid granulations right here. Some books call it arachnoid villi. Some books call it arachnoid granulations. It looks like a cauliflower, right? And what happens is, as you have too much cerebrospinal fluid being produced, that CSF gets funneled into the arachnoid granulations. As it goes into the arachnoid granulations, the granulations are actually embedded on the superior sagittal sinus, a very low pressure vein. And what happens? The more CSF, the more pressure from below, the more driving force for cerebrospinal fl spinal fluid to be pushed into the superior sagittal sinus. So basically, this is our way to reabsorb any excess amount of CSF. Is any excess amount of CSF goes into the arachnoid granulations, open it up, and in those granulations are tiny openings that allows cerebrospinal fluid to drain into the vein. That way, we're allowing our brain and the fluid there to get reabsorbed. That's why the arachnoid granulation is so important. Now, if we, and probably the better way to understanding it is this, what happens if the arachnoid granulation is blocked? That happens sometimes in people with, right, with certain kind of dwarfism. Well, if it's blocked, you're producing half a liter a day, but not reabsorbing that same amount. So you're producing too much, and now we can't reabsorb. So you're gonna have a buildup of cerebral spinal fluid that will then create intense intracranial pressure, massive headaches, and if you don't get it treated, you're gonna herniate your brainstem and pass away from this. So just these small kind of you know pieces right here, it looks like cauliflower piece, right? But they're scattered throughout our connection with the superior sagittal sinus, right? That area of the arachnoid granulation allows for reabsorption of cerebrospinal fluid. Blockage means no reabsorption. Blockage means that now we have a buildup and we're gonna have hydrocephalus. Now keep in mind, your brain itself has no pain receptors. When you brain, herniate the brain stem, the meninges have lots of pain receptors. So those activate and cause us massive pain. Blood supply to the brain. Brain is about three pounds, and depending on how much you weigh, right, it can account for either five to six percent of your body weight. Yet it receives up to 20 percent of the blood that's pumped by the heart. We call that blood that's pumped out by the heart the cardiac output. In other words, you receive much greater supply of blood than you would expect. Right? And the reason why it's simple, right? Your brain can't store oxygen. Your brain can't store glucose. Because of that, it needs steady amount of oxygen and glucose for fuel to use for its function. If it gets interrupted, even for seconds, you can have unconsciousness. If it gets interrupted, the blood flow gets interrupted for minutes, you will have irreversible brain damage. This is why strokes, Strokes cause us to have a, some kind of blood clot occurring in the brain. Well, that will cause irreversible brain damage. Now, somebody will say, yeah, you know, my parents got better after a stroke. We see people that do get better and regain function after a stroke. How is that possible then? Well, it's possible because our brain is pretty special. It's pretty plastic. In other words, even as elderly people, other areas of the brain can pick up the role that was damaged. So we can see that and people do get better with physical and occupational therapy. The brain also has a high metabolic rate and therefore depends on constant supply of oxygen and glucose. Again, we do know and we have talked about one major cluster of cells 
that can store glucose as glycogen, that can also store oxygen in terms of its myoglobin, and that's your skeletal muscles. The brain doesn't have any of that. Because of that, it needs constant blood supply. What else do we see in the brain? The brain has huge arteries that are just gonna direct that blood flow. The internal carotid artery, where we bring blood up and goes into the middle cerebral artery. The vertebral arteries, right, found in our transverse foramen of our cervical vertebrae. Those vertebral arteries come up and they help bring blood supply to your blood, to your brain stem, to your cerebellum. So we're gonna see that there's a lot of anastomoses, a lot of collateral ways we can bring blood to the brain. All because if blood flow is interrupted for more than a few minutes, you will have permanent damage. All right, we talked about the blood brain barrier, blood brain barrier formed by astrocytes, covering up any gaps in the blood vessels that are entering your brain. As it covers it up, only very small things can get through. Things that can get through without help include things that are lipid soluble. Gases can get from your bloodstream, out of your bloodstream, into the tissue of your brain. So it makes sense that gases like oxygen can get in and out pretty easily. Makes sense carbon dioxide can get into the bloodstream pretty e uh, uh, into the bloodstream pretty easily because we need to get rid of it. The weird thing is, uh, all gases can enter the can go through the blood brain barrier pretty easily, including laughing gas. Right, that's why it works so quickly. Now, other things can get through, including lipid lipid soluble material. Even now, right, your astrocytes are made out of phospholipids. Your endothelial cells are made out of phospholipids. So all lipid soluble material can get in and out. So your vitamins D, E, K, A, all of those can get through real easy. Now, the weird thing is nicotine, ethanol, even heroin can get in pretty easily. Kind of makes sense, right? Most people aren't gonna take heroin, hopefully. But we do know that when people are taking things that are similar to heroin, narcotics, right? It does affect your mood. It does give you kind of, it does affect your brain, giving you that high sensation. Water-soluble substances move through by transport mechanisms. In other words, proteins. So glucose can't just go through. It needs a glucose receptor to get through. Now, the last thing we'll talk about are the cranial nerves. Now, for our lab practical, we will go through the cranial nerves and we'll go through it and how they're named and how can you tell which one is a cranial nerve? Because you'll need to know, right? So the cranial nerves are numbered 1 through 12 in Roman numerals. Some of them are purely sensory meaning all they do is bring information into the brain. If you think about it, we know two of them already. Optic nerve. Well, in an optic nerve, you're just bringing light stimuli in. Olfactory nerve. Well, when you smell, the olfactory nerve activates, and you're bringing that sense of smell in to your brain. Makes sense that there is no other motor movement because all you're doing is bringing that sensation in. So some of them, these cranial nerves are purely sensory. Some are a combination of sensory and motor. Motor in terms of somatic motor, right? So control the skeletal muscles of your face, skeletal muscles of your neck. Those are all functions of the cranial nerve. Some of them are parasympathetic, meaning they activate your rest and digest functions. We're gonna see, there's four of them that are parasympathetic. Some of them are incredibly very important, like the vagus nerve. It goes and activates your GI tract and GU tract. It decreases your heart rate, decreases your respiratory rate. Some of the parasympathetic ones aren't really important. I mean, it's important, but not as important as a vagus nerve, right? All they do is maybe activate one of your, maybe one of your, product, either the product gland or your submandibular or sublingual gland, 
on the word otherwise known as your right salivary glands. And that's all they do is activate one of the salivary glands, but because they activate your salivary glands, now you have saliva, you have enzymes, you have enzymes, rest and digest gets activated. That makes it parasympathetic then, even though it doesn't look like it's a big deal. So let's talk about the cranial nerves. And there's a good chart to figure out which ones are which, right? Which ones are sensory, olfactory, optic, vestibular, cochlear? Well, you're hearing, that's just sensations and balance as well. Which ones are purely motor? Which ones are both? And which ones are parasympathetic? So let's talk about the first one, olfactory. Now, the name of the nerves, the number of the nerves, the nerves are numbered from one to 12 based on where we see it first, meaning the very first one should be the most anterior, right? So if you see it most anterior, that's got the very first nerve. So the first one should be number one then, coming straight up. It looks like a little antenna underneath the frontal lobe. That's your olfactory nerve. The second one is in your eyeball, optic. Then the third one is the one slightly behind the optic nerve, the ocular motor. So there is a way to kind of knowing this, and I'll probably, you know, I want you guys to look on my videos, especially on the cranial nerves, to review it. It's on my uh, lab videos. All right, so first one, olfactory goes through the cribriform plate. The olfactory bulbs are formed by those olfactory nerves exiting, right? Coming up from your cribriform plate, synapsing, and then going backwards. So what does it allow you to do? Smell. Is there any motor function? No. If you have a problem with this cranial nerve, you have ability, you lose ability to smell. The next one is a little bit more posterior. So if you take a look, right? This one's slightly more posterior compared to the olfactory nerve. This one's an optic. Cranial nerve two, optic nerve. What does it allow us to do? See, light stimuli. That's it. It's important, incredibly important. But there's no motor function. There's no parasympathetic function. All it does is takes that light information in for our brain to then integrate and, figure, and decipher. Now, the next one is called your ocular motor. And that's even further behind your optic nerve. So your ocular motor nerve, you can see it in blue right there. Notice how it's behind, more posterior to your uh, uh, optic nerve. Again, we number it based on anterior to posterior. Olfactory first, because it's most anterior, then optic, number two, is slightly, slightly more posterior. And now the third one is definitely more posterior. Number three, ocular motor. Ocular motor goes to muscles of your eyeball that we'll talk about as well next week. The muscles of the eyeball include your superior rectus, which moves your eyeball up. Your inferior rectus, which moves it down. Your medial rectus, which moves your eyeball medially. And, right, your, the last one we're gonna look at is, right, going to be your inferior oblique. So a lot of the ocular motor nerve goes to the muscles of the eyeball, hence the name, oculomotor. Motor to the ocular or the eye. So it allows us to see up, allows us to see down, allows us to see the middle, allows us to look down and under, right? Down and out, that's the inferior oblique muscles. So when we're actually looking at the eyeball, and we're looking straight ahead. So you're in class and you're looking straight ahead or you're looking at a computer screen, right? Keep in mind that when you're looking straight ahead, it doesn't mean that your eyeball's resting. What it means when you're looking straight ahead is that you have opposite muscles contracting with the same strength. So superior rectus muscle contracts a little bit, 
so does the inferior rectus. Your lateral rectus contracts, so does the medial rectus. All four muscles are contracting with the same strength, allowing your eye to look straight ahead. Perfect. When I want it to move to the right outside, then the lateral rectus muscle contracts with a little bit more force, moving my eyeball to the outside. So we're going to see movement of the eye requires more strength. So of that muscle that we want to move the eyeball to. So in terms of ocular motor nerve, movement of the eye, this is the only one of the nerves that will move your eye in many directions. This is the biggest one. The other two nerves that allows you to move the eye only goes to specific muscles. Again, we're gonna see there's six different muscles that moves the eye. Superior rectus, inferior rectus. Medial rectus, lateral rectus. Notice how they're all kind of opposites. The other two are what we call oblique muscles. Superior oblique, inferior oblique. Superior oblique is gonna move your eye, right? It's gonna flip it actually down and out. Inferior oblique, up and out. I think I said it the opposite before, right? So you have these six muscles and they allow you to move the eyeball in a lot of different directions. Now the other muscle, that the ocular motor nerve goes to is your levator palpebrae superioris, the muscle that allows you to open your eyelid, right? So there are people that have what we call Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome, if you guys ever look at a picture of Forrest Whitaker, right? So when we're done, look at a picture of Forrest Whitaker. One eye is always droopy. He has Horner syndrome. The droopiness of the eye is called ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S, with a P, right? Again, the P is silent. Ptosis means that your eye, your eyelid, even when you're awake, looks like it's, looks like it's going to fall down, right? It's not your eyeball is completely open. Now, the weird thing is this. Besides the muscles that it enervates, the extraocular muscles, in here, right, you can see again, superior, inferior rectus, medial rectus, levator palpebrae, and inferior oblique. Besides those muscles, it also goes deep into the eye and it causes our pupils to constrict. You guys have all had it, maybe when you're asleep, you're almost asleep, the light is really, you know, the, your room is really dark, because it's really dark, your pupils are completely dilated. And then somebody turns on the light real quick. And right away, it hurts your eyes, right? Well, that can burn your eyes if there's enough stimulus. So we need to protect the retinal cells of the eye. That's what the function of our sphincter of the pupils allows us to do. It constricts the pupil, so then less light gets through. That's a parasympathetic function. It's weird, right, that that little thing makes it parasympathetic, but it is. Because it allows us to constrict the pupils, we say the ocular motor nerve is sensory, motor, and parasympathetic. Next one, trochlear nerve. Keep in mind, I said that we have six extraocular eye muscles that allows us to move the eye. The ocular motor nerve goes to four of them. Now we have two more that the ocular motor nerve don't innervate. The first one is your superior oblique. The superior oblique muscles allows us to look down and out. And that is through cranial nerve number four called the trochlear nerve. That's all it does. Isn't that crazy? The only thing that trochlear nerve does is to activate the superior oblique, allowing you to look down and out. That's the only thing. The next one, so now, right, if you take a look, the trochlear and the ocular motor nerve, the, they are going to exit the brain at very similar areas in terms of anterior and posterior. 
right? So what happens? The one that exits out to the front, most medially gets a lower number. This one exits out to the front and it's most medial. So it gets the lower number, number three. Trochlear comes out at the same area generally, but from the back. Because it comes from the back, it gets a lower number, number four. So it'll be the next cranial nerve number we should see as we move down the brainstem. Because now we're at the brainstem region. Now the numbers start to lower as we move from superior to inferior. So we use the number four, the next one's number five. That's number five right here. And you can see, right, it's big. And it's found right on the pons, slightly inferior to where we saw ocular motor and trochlear exit. Because of that, it's got the lower number, number five. The trigeminal is your main somatosensory cranial nerve of your head, face, right, region. So it's main, main somatic sensory. Somatic sensory is anything that's not special, not light, not smell, right? Not hearing, not equilibrium, not taste. So your main somatic sensations from your face is going to be brought in by the trigeminal nerve. These are the branches. You don't need to know the branches. You just need to know it's bringing in all somatic sensation from your face and the top of your skull. Now, the neck region, you're gonna have spinal nerves and they're dermatomes bringing somatic sensations in. But in the face, we don't have spinal nerves. We have only cranial nerves. This is the one that brings all the information for pain, pressure, tickle, itch, uh, you know, temperature, vibration. All of those somatic sensations of the face are brought in by the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve then activates, allowing us then to send a signal to the postcentral gyrus to interpret those sensations. What else? Besides your main somatic sensory nerve, it also allows us to chew. It gives motor signals to the muscles of mastication, masseter, temporalis, pterygoids. All of those get activated due to the trigeminal nerve as well. So trigeminal, the next one then, right, is gonna be more inferior and it's gonna have the lower number. So we've already used cranial nerve five for trigeminal. The next one will be cranial nerve six. See how cranial nerve six right here is slightly lower. Cranial nerve six is your abducens. This is the third of the cranial nerves required to move the eyes in many directions. The first one is ocular motor, went to four of the muscles. Second one, trochlear, just goes to the superior oblique. This is a third one, abducens, and all it does is activate the lateral rectus on each side. So you have abducens bilaterally, one on each side, goes to each eyeball and activates only the lateral rectus muscle. Kind of crazy, right? So if you see somebody sometimes and you look in their eye and you look in the face and there's something just, you just, you know, it, I don't want to say it looks weird but there's something about their eye that looks different right when you compare it to the other one well usually they have a little bit of movement there where it's not the eyeball isn't just looking medially keep in mind if i look straight ahead i should have equal strength between the medial and lateral rectus muscles that allows me to look straight well what happens is people that have a little bit of strabismus right where the eye kind of deviates a little bit, right? A lazy eye, people call it. Well, usually it is due to either a problem with the actual muscle, the lateral rectus, or with the abducens nerve. And gives people that, the weird thing is you only see it usually when they're relaxed or tired. When they're actually looking and they're trying to track something, the lateral rectus muscle is able to activate. 
The next one then, so we see, right, the cranial nerve number six. We're gonna see three cranial nerves right here that exits at the same locations in terms of superior and inferior. So there's three of them. The first one is your abducens. The next one is slightly lateral to it, right? Because it's not medial, it doesn't get the higher number or the lower number. So it's slightly lateral to cranial nerve six. So now it gets a lower nerve, number seven. Seven is your facial nerve. Whereas your trigeminal nerve is your main somatic sensory nerve for facial type of sensations that are somatic sensory, right? The, tri the facial nerve is your main motor nerve. It goes to all of your muscles of facial expression, orbicularis oris, orbicularis oculi, your levator labi, your zygomaticus minor and major, your depressor labi, Right? So all those muscles, your isorius, all those muscles that allows us to smile, to frown, all of those muscles are going to be activated by the facial nerve. Now, when people have facial nerve issues, they have paralysis on one side, and we call it Bell's palsy. So the facial nerve gives motor signals to all of your muscles of facial expression. It also has sensory signals for taste. Because it's got sensory signals from taste from the anterior two thirds of your tongue, it makes this nerve a parasympathetic nerve. Rest and digest, right? So in terms of parasympathetic, it also gives motor signals to your salivary glands, submandibular and sublingual, right? Now, it kind of makes sense. You want to eat things that are more sweet. Usually people have a sweet tooth because we all want to eat something that tastes good. The better it tastes, the more nutrition it should have. Because of that, the, uh, the salivary glands main purpose is to break down starches. So then we can activate the taste buds. So then we ingest more of that food. Facial nerve, motor to all muscles of facial expression, and sensory from the tongue for taste and the anterior two thirds, parasympathetic motor function to activate salivary glands, submandibular and sublingual. Because it activates the salivary glands, it's parasympathetic. You guys have probably seen people with partial paralysis of their face. They have Bell's palsy, right? Now, with Bell's palsy, take a look at all that area where the facial nerve comes out. Is it possible to have a stroke right in that area and not affect anything else? No, it isn't. So Bell's palsy is a real condition, but when we look on a CT, when we look on an MRI, usually we do not see anything, right? It is a real condition that is caused sometimes by inflammation of that nerve or stress. Stress can cause Bell's palsy. We don't know why, but it can. So the treatment for Bell's palsy is just anti-inflammatories and time. Usually it spontaneously resolves within the first month or so. Now, to prevent damage, because this goes, right, to your orbicularis oculi muscles, allowing you to close your eye, well, now that muscle is paralyzed on that side. Your eye has a hard time closing. So some people have to wear an eye patch to bed, right? So you don't damage your eyeball. The next one, vestibulo cochlear nerve. And again, take a look at how close the facial is to the vestibulo cochlear. They're immediately next to each other. There's no way you can have a stroke and not affect the vestibulo cochlear nerve, right? But people with Bell's palsy, all they have is that facial nerve palsy. Hearing is not affected. That's why we believe that there is a kind of a, you know, 
It is organic, it is real, but there is kind of a stress-related cause to it. All right, vestibular cochlear nerve, there's two nerves. The vestibular nerve, which brings in balancing signals, equilibrium, right? It comes from these areas that look like little loops called the semicircular canals. The main purpose is to receive motion senses, right? So you're running around in a circle, right? Well, you're to prevent falling, we need to make sure as you're running around quickly in a circle, or God forbid, spinning around the circle, right? We need to make sure that you don't fall over. So we activate certain loops. So then when you stop, you might feel dizzy, but hopefully you don't fall over. Then the second part of the vestibular and cochlear nerve is a cochlear nerve portion, and that allows us to hear. We'll talk more about this nerve in our special senses section. But for now, just keep in mind, two different nerves forming the vestibular cochlear nerve. Vestibular for balance and equilibrium, cochlear for hearing. The next one, glossopharyngeal. Now, the glossopharyngeal is our second, third, sorry, third parasympathetic nerve. The first one was ocular motor, and that was parasympathetic because it allowed us to constrict the pupil. The second parasympathetic cranial nerve was our facial. It allows us to activate our salivary glands, submandibular, sublingual, and allowed us to have taste, special sense of taste on the anterior two thirds. The glossopharyngeal allows us to have a special sense of taste from the posterior third. So from the back third, we also have parasympathetic stimulation of our parotid glands now. So the parotid glands are activated not by the facial, but by the glossopharyngeal. And it gives us motor signals to our pharyngeal muscles so then we can swallow. Notice how it kind of works together, right? When you're eating, the better it tastes, the more you want to eat it. So what do we need? We need taste sensation. So posterior third, glossopharyngeal. In order to taste something, you need enzymes to break the starches apart. That's where the salivary gland secretion comes in, also from the glossopharyngeal. And now, once we start chewing, we want to swallow it down. So we need to swallow it down. That's where the motor signals to the pharyngeal muscle comes in. It allows you to activate the swallowing reflex. So then we can move that food from your mouth to your throat to your esophagus. Perfect. Number 10, vagus nerve. Way low now, right? We're in the area of the medulla. This is, besides the phrenic nerve, the second most important nerve we have in our body. The vagus, you have one on each side, is the only parasympathetic nerve that goes parasympathetic cranial nerve that goes all the way down in your body. If you take a look, it goes to your heart, it goes to your lungs, it goes to your GI tract, it goes to your kidneys and your small and large intestine. So it is our main parasympathetic nerve. It allows you to slow down the heart rate by its connection to our sinoatrial node. It allows you to slow down your respiratory rate by its connection to our laryngeal current. Uh, branches, right? It allows us to activate the stomach. So then we can have increased rest and digest, right? So it's our main parasympathetic cranial nerve. Goes to all of our thoracic and abdominal viscera. And if it is cut bilaterally, because you have one on each side, right? And you take a look at it, at the heart, they all meet up. When I had to do, right, when I got to, uh, don't, didn't have to, but when I got to scrub in to open heart surgery, what we would do in open heart surgery is to cut the costal cartilages by a, you know, like, it looks like a saw, reciprocating saw. It's huge, right? Once we cut the costal cartilage, we have to crack open the chest so that we can see the heart and lungs. Before we look and cut into the heart itself, the pericardium of the heart, we always 
look for the vagus nerve on each side. The reason why is simple. If we were to accidentally cut the vagus nerve bilaterally, you cannot slow down your heart rate. Your heart rate then will just go so fast, it goes into supraventricular tachycardia. The person will die on the table immediately. All right? That's how important the vagus nerve is. Before we even cut into the pericardium, we look, we find the vagus nerve, we clamp it off, so then we always are able to move away from it. Because we cut it on both sides bilaterally, we will kill that patient. It is that important of a nerve. Why? Because it goes to all of these abdominal visceral organs and activates those abdominal visceral organs, as well as decreases stimulation of the heart. The accessory nerve, 11, further down a little bit, right? It's found, and the weird thing is actually found between the medulla and the start of the spinal cord. So we're talking about like, you know, through the foramen magnum. So it's the lowest one. The spinal accessory nerve goes to your sternocleidomastoids and your trapezius, allowing us to elevate, depress, rotate the scapula, and rotate the neck. The only thing it does is that it's motor signals to those muscles. The last one, hypoglossal. And people get mixed up between hypoglossal and glossopharyngeal. Hypoglossal just goes to the muscles of the tongue. There's no sensory, there's no parasympathetic. Hypoglossal nerve goes to your geniohyoid muscles, your styloglossus, stylohyoid, genio, right, hyoid muscles, all those muscles that allows you to move the tongue, that allows you to elevate the hyoid bone so that we can swallow. All those muscles are innervated by this last cranial nerve, cranial nerve number 12, the hypoglossal. Motor to intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the tongue, allowing us to talk, allowing us to have speech and language skills. So even though it doesn't seem that important, without this nerve, you will not be able to form the words properly when we're trying to speak. When this nerve is cut, and there's kind of one of the weird things that doctors do is when you look and somebody complains of having a sore throat, they ask you to stick out your tongue. They're not asking to look at the throat when they ask you to stick out your tongue. When you stick out your tongue, they're looking to see if the tongue goes out right in the middle of your mouth. If it does, then both hypoglossal nerves are activating, right? So there's no problem with them. If your tongue comes out and it only goes to one side, right, is a sign that you have damage of that hypoglossal nerve. So if it, you stick your tongue out, and instead of going to the center, it moves to the right. It's a sign that there's a problem with the hypoglossal nerve on the right side. So just small things like that can be a sign of issues with a cranial nerve, right? Now, that'll be the last thing we cover here. Keep in mind, these cranial nerves, I will have videos on how to find them, right? How to look for them in terms of models and look at those models, videos on our lab videos link. In terms of our next or the final lecture exam, the final lecture exam will include the cranial nerves. In the lecture exam, I will not ask you where it's found. I would ask what the function is. So. If you have problems with, right, with the constriction of the eye, so then it's the, your, you know, your irises and your pupil stays dilated, right? If you have problems with movement of the eyeball as well, which cranial nerve is affected? Ocular motor, right? If you can't move your head and neck to one side, you can't elevate the scapula on one side, which cranial nerve is affected? accessory. All right, so those are questions I'd ask for the final exam, final lecture exam. Any questions at all? Let me see. Sorry, guys.